Well now, here we have a painting created by an artist called William Holman Hunt. Uh, he was uh, one of the founding members of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. He painted this in 1853. Um, it was a commission and um, he called it the Awakening Conscience. And what we have in the painting are uh, two young people, uh, a man seated in front of a piano, and rising from his lap is a young woman. Uh, she seems to be gazing over our shoulders, and there's a mirror behind the couple which shows us the scene which she might be staring at um, out of uh, some double windows. Now, when we look at this painting uh, from the perspective of the 21st century, there are some things about it that we're actually quite blind to, but they would have been obvious to a 19th century viewer. The most significant one is that this woman is not wearing a dress. She's wearing her night dress. And hastily tied around her waist is the counterpane uh, from a bed. Uh, they'd also have uh, realised that um, she's very late in getting out of bed in the morning, um, that the young man is uh, dressed and ready to go visiting, but uh, she's still in her night clothes. So that makes this a fairly scandalous um, painting of uh, a young woman who uh, keeps unusual hours and who finds herself inappropriately dressed in an intimate situation with a young man. The other thing which would have been obvious to contemporary viewers uh, would be the uncharacteristic untidiness of this Victorian sitting room. If we look down at the floor, we see all sorts of things scattered about. Um, um, the young man has tossed his glove aside, it's landed on the carpet. And there are strands of wool which have fallen from a tapestry, which we imagine the young woman has been working on, um, which is unravelling. Uh, tapestry is, of course, featured in the Odyssey, uh, where Penelope, waiting for her husband Odysseus to return from the Trojan Wars uh, famously used her tapestry to maintain her fidelity to her husband while he was away but this tapestry is actually falling apart and here's another collection of little clues or cues um, uh, placed in the painting by the artist on the piano music stand, although we can't see it clearly um, in this reproduction, is some sheet music. And it's the music of the setting of Thomas More's poem, Oft in the Stilly Night. And this is a, a sentimental poem which regrets the happier days which are gone because true friends are no more. We also see on top of the piano um, a vase of flowers and the flowers are beginning to droop and fade um, as though they've not been cared for or properly watered. And there's a clock. And the clock is encased in a glass dome. So within this sitting room, time itself has been imprisoned and taken captive. And again, um, the quality of this reproduction doesn't allow us to read this, but uh, tossed aside on the floor is uh, a musical setting of Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, Tears, Idle Tears, which was just published just a few years before this painting uh, was completed. Um, a poem which speaks about the regret 
of happy times which are past. And to add to the general chaos of the room, underneath the table, there's a cat which is toying with a trapped bird. It's already torn one of its wings. And from what we know about cats, it's not going to kill the bird immediately. It's, it's going to play with it and cause it a great deal of suffering before it finally dies. And when we look at the hands of the couple, we see that the, the man, um, with his one remaining gloved hand, is idly playing a tune on the piano. Uh, his other hand appears to be open in a gesture where he might be protesting a point or asking for an explanation. But it's the woman's hands which are most eloquent. They're clasped together. They're, as it were, um, she is wringing her hands. And we can see her left hand on top. And on the fingers of those hands, on all but one finger, um, there are rings. And of course, the one finger without a ring is her wedding finger. So this is a picture of what the artist considered to be an immoral situation. Two unmarried young people in an intimate uh, position uh, without a chaperone alone in what we presume is either her apartment or an apartment which he has provided for her. Now the woman is uh, in the moment of just rising from the lap of the young man as though she has suddenly realised something or one might say come to her senses. She seems to be staring out of the room possibly at the scene we see reflected in the mirror, which is a scene of springtime where new life is bursting from the otherwise apparently dead branches of a, a tree in the garden. Now the woman who posed as the model for the young woman in this painting is a lady called Annie Miller. We know this from notes about the painting itself, but also because she was used as a model uh, by a number of the other pre-Raphaelite painters. We don't have any account, as far as I know, uh, from Annie Miller about her relationship with William Holman Hunt, but we do know that at the time of this painting they were engaged to each other. The relationship actually broke up some six years later um, because Holman Hunt said that he found her behaviour unacceptable and other male members of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood also reported uh, about her behaviour in fairly negative ways. But we need to bear in mind that those are only the accounts of the men who knew her and not her own account. And the young man in the painting is based on a friend of William Holman Hunt, uh, a man called Augustus Egg, who was himself uh, a painter, an artist. Now, Augustus Egg is famous or notorious for one particular set of paintings which he created. They came to be known as his triptych, um, which simply means three panels, but is often thought of as something which you find in a church. The first panel is a fairly stark one. Uh, it shows um, a Victorian family. The man is slumped in a chair while two children play unaware almost in the corner. And in his hand, he's clutching a letter. We are led to understand from the things which uh, the artist wrote that this man has received a letter informing him 
of his wife's infidelity. And at his feet, uh, we see his wife in an attitude of pleading. Now, the, the second panel shows a scene from a few years later. And these are the two girls in the first painting who are older now. One of them wears a black dress of mourning. And the artist tells us that what has happened is that their father has uh, died from a broken heart. Uh, their mother is nowhere to be seen. She is elsewhere, as far as we know, from this painting. And the two girls are living in what would have been called straightened circumstances. The room is hardly furnished at all compared to the room that they grew up in as children. And this is a consequence of their mother's adulterous relationship. Now the third and final painting in this set of three actually takes place on the same evening. It's the same moon that we see in the sky there that the girls were staring at out of their window. But here we see their mother. She's clearly destitute and taken shelter in one of the arches by the Thames. She seems to be carrying a child, a, an infant, whose legs are sticking out from under her cloak or covering. And we've got no indication about whether the child is alive or dead. And just like Holman Hunt's painting, the artist Augustus Egg has scattered clues uh, around the scene. There's a, a poster on the wall of the arch advertising two plays, one called Victims, the other called The Cure of Love, which were both about um, unhappy marriages. There's also um, a poster advertising pleasure excursions to Paris, and we know from elsewhere that um, the equivalent of travel agents promoted Paris as a destination, certainly for a single or even married um, men um, because of the attractions of the alleged loose morals of the women who could be found there. So this is a very gloomy set of paintings to say the least which purports to show the consequences of the infidelity, the adultery of a woman in an otherwise happy marriage. Uh, I'm not going to say more about that at this point because it's a subject all of its own. But these kind of paintings, sadly, were not that unusual in the 19th century. There are a number of others of um, young women with babies being cast out of family homes, women whose bodies are found drowned on the shores of the Thames, having thrown themselves from bridges in their despair. And they are clearly pointing a very moralistic finger at the responsibility of women in society. Let's get back to Holman Hunt's brighter picture. Here then he's presented us with a couple in what he wants us to understand is an immoral relationship. And the woman is rising from his lap. Uh, it seems to be symbolic of her about to decide to leave this corrosive relationship, um, the rela a relationship which would be corrosive for both of them, and for her to set out on a new path. Now, things aren't always what they seem in paintings. This painting was a commission and uh, when Holman Hunt originally painted it, the young woman's face did not look like this. As far as I know, 
we don't have an image of what the original face looked like. But the man for whom uh, the painting was made, a Mr. Thomas Fairburn, an industrialist from uh, Manchester, um, said that he could not live with the original painting where the woman's expression was one of shocked despair. Uh, someone who realized that for her there was no hope and that the future was bleak, to say the least. And he urged and required um, Holman Hunt to change the face, uh, which he did to this more hopeful expression. Uh, we need to know that later in his life, Holman Hunt expressed his regret that he had changed the face. Clearly, he would have preferred a face which was full of despair rather than one full of hope. And so here we are with this painting, which on the face of it looks colourful, and when you see it on the walls of Tate Britain, it certainly catches the eye. And yet to me, it's a very gloomy and judgmental painting. Um, it is a painting where a male artist has put a heavy weight on the shoulders of women and doesn't seem to have any judgment for the man involved in the relationship. Victorian society was not as prudish as we've often grown up to believe. And yet this artist in his mid-thirties saw fit to create a work which makes these very severe judgments on people in circumstances other than his own.